Welcome to the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, a nonprofit organization dedicated to furthering both education and research in the field of oral implantology. My name is Dr. Waji Khan. I'm a dental surgeon and also the course director for a series of online lectures provided as a service to the profession of dentistry to deliver a literature and knowledge-based approach to dental implant education for practitioners interested in learning more about how to implement the discipline of oral implantology into their clinical practice. This online course should be merged with a suitable clinical course and long-term mentorship study club program so that the learner can maximize their benefit from the didactic online program. The production of this series of lectures was partially funded by an educational grant from the International Dental Implant Academy. Lecture 18, Marketing Dental Implants. So in terms of marketing today, we're going to basically go over a bit of an agenda. We're not, we're not intending on this uh, online program being Marketing 101 or, or some sort of like crash course MBA, but we are going to get you to start thinking about a few things. And in terms of that, basically what we want to cover today are five or six different points. We're going to talk about strategy. We're going to talk about structure. We're going to talk about internal referrals, external referrals. Number five, we're going to talk about marketing materials. And lastly, we're going to talk about uh, a, a, a thing uh, like implant seminars. So strategy. Basically, the strategy is to have patients choose dental implant solutions when they are the best option for you. They always say, or John Dewey once said, that democracy is about education through knowledge. And basically, one cannot make a democratic choice without all of the information. So as oral health practitioners, it is our job, basically, to try to educate our patients with as much knowledge as possible so that they can make the most democratic choice with respect to treatment options for them. And I realize that from a consent perspective, legally, we are required to do this uh, as part of, uh, for, from an ethical perspective as well. However, we have to ask ourselves what educational tools we do use in our office. Now, they t speak about uh, things like uh, tell, show, do, or what they would refer to as auditory learners, visual learners, and kinesthetic learners uh, in terms of uh, gardeners' multiple intelligences for the way people learn. But however, we need to ask ourselves, what type of educational programs do we have in our own offices that we can use to educate people and give them a chance to make democratic choices? So we have to ask ourselves, do we have the, um, the, any sort of audio aids, any sort of visual aids, any aids that could, people can play around with? Uh, sometimes these are, these are things that obviously take more of your time to uh, go forward and educate people. However, the payoff for these these uh, these, uh, these 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 ventures or th these uh, these programs that you implement in your office can be beneficial when trying to basically sell dental implants to patients. So, in terms of selling dental implants, or what we refer to as case presentation strategies, they are vast, and they begin basically with a diagnostic philosophy of creating lifetime strategies for oral health. So if dentistry is not diagnosed, as they say, it cannot be planned. And if it cannot be presented, it cannot be made affordable, and it cannot be accepted by the patient. So if you believe that all patients deserve the right to know everything dentistry has to offer them and have the systems in place to encourage them to make good choices, then you can set the stage for revolutionary strategies within your own office to increase your case acceptance. So with effective case presentations, we basically speak about five basic principle. So the first step is basically to know and document the patient's individual dental IQ, their perceived problems, their dental goals and expectations, so that you can customize your presentation style. And we'll harp on this point here a little bit. Basically, it's to know, know who your patient is and what their wants and needs are and where they want to get to. There's no point, as I said to many of my patients, a uh, first question I ask them is, you know, why are they here to see me or what do they think that dental implants can do for them? Uh, many times, and believe it or not, I've had patients who they actually weren't looking for dental implants. Uh, you know, in the analogy I use for patients all the time is, are you here just for a car or are you here for a Ferrari? Uh, what is it that you're looking for? And if patients tell me that they're looking for the best that we can offer them, 
then great, that's what, something which we're going to do. If they're just going to tell me that they're just here looking for some sort of a prosthesis and uh, you know, a set of dentures with some polygrip like grandma used to have is going to work for them, then that's fine too. But however, there is a bit of a, a gap that sort of exists there. And from a gap analysis perspective, what we need to do is basically try to educate people uh, so that they can make that democratic choice of whether they want just you know, granny's old dentures with polygrip or if they want the best that dentists can offer them today. The second step is basically to present the patient's existing dental condition to them based upon the result of a complete examination uh, in the areas of the health of their gums, the health of their teeth, their occlusion, the health of their smile, and lay out the findings in a simple format. Many times, as we said before, a picture is worth a thousand words, and try to use lay terms. People don't necessarily understand what a class one malocclusion is, or what bruxism is, or what chronic generalized uh, severe periodontitis is. So we need to use lay terms so that people can understand what it is that we're actually explaining to them. The third step is to basically present treatment solutions that are available and realistic and within their budget that are going to help them reach their goals and expectations. And also be sure to relate recommendations back to the findings of their examination one area at a time while discussing the benefits or the proposed benefits of treatment. The fourth step basically is to explain the benefits of accepting the treatment and what it will do for them and the consequences of delaying or declining treatment. Be aware, scare tactics don't work. So if basically telling a patient they're going to suffer digestive tract disorder or facial disfigurement doesn't necessarily increase acceptance. We also know this from patients who are smokers. We tell patients about you know mouth cancer and lung cancer and all these sorts of like you know unfortunate uh, outcomes that can occur. However, scare tactics don't necessarily work very well for getting people to quit smoking. The final step, which we basically call closure, or asking for a decision, is often the hardest part for people, and I'll admit this is the hardest thing for me. Uh, I got into dentistry because I wanted to help people. I didn't get into dentistry because I, I wanted to, you know, flip people upside down and shake them for change. Now, you know, we try to offer very, very, very affordable uh, dental implant solutions for patients, but nonetheless, it's always difficult uh, to ask for that closure, or ask for patients to make uh, decisions. If you can't do it, sometimes it's good to have a treatment plan coordinator or a practice manager uh, who can do those things for you, but you need to clarify what are the questions you will need to answer for them so to basically proceed from a clinical perspective. Uh, some of my colleagues give uh, price, uh, you know, the, the price is good for six months or something like that. I'm not a big proponent of that, namely because I'm a dentist, I'm not, I'm not a businessman. Uh, Similarly, I, I like calling my patients my patients. Some people call them clients. Uh, once again, I'm not. Uh, I, that's you know, I'm a clinician, so I like calling my patients patients. And I basically, uh, you know, I don't try to, you know, uh, what, what's the term? Hard sell uh, people uh, with respect to uh, with respect to the solutions that we provide. And the next thing we're going to talk about is structure. The structure of your practice has to support the strategy, or you have what is referred to in the business world as a lack of internal consistency. So strategy must support the structure and the structure must support the strategy. I realize this is oversimplifying probably an entire MBA program. However, many times you will find in business, and we're talking about big, big, big businesses, and these would be what they refer to as MBA case studies, where there have been huge strategy structure mismatches, and people have lost tons and tons of money. Uh, being a dental practice, it's a little bit easier to try to match your strategy and structure, as you know, hopefully you're the only person, or you're the CEO, or you're the you're the king, and you can make all the the, or the queen, and you can make all of the decisions in your practice. But you need to make sure that your strategy supports your structure. So structure basically consists of many things. So things like staffing, uh, the culture of your organization, the management style that you use, and the control systems. I could go on to you know I could go on each one of these topics for probably you know a month or two. Uh, but namely, what I'm basically trying to get at here, if your structure is, if your strategy is to have patients seek dental implant solutions. You need to make sure that you have a structure that sort of permits that. So you need to make sure that you invest in the appropriate equipment, you invest in uh, training your staff, and invest in ensuring that you have a culture where uh, your staff and your, your other professionals you work with can reinforce uh, some of the uh, some of the things that you do. Uh, I worked in one practice where we did dental implants and none of the hygienists knew a thing about how to provide any care for dental implants whatsoever. And I, I said to the practice owner, I said, if you want to be doing implants in your office, you need to have some sort of uh, system in place whereby these people can come back for recall. Otherwise, you know, you, you, what, what's the point? There's no point in having these people go elsewhere uh, to manage their implants for you. Uh, so these are the types of things that I'm sort of basically uh, getting at uh, with respect to uh, structure. 
if anyone has any questions, please email me and we can discuss this, uh, discuss this point later. Internal referral. So the best source of business is happy customers, period. Uh, invest in making sure that every patient walks out the door satisfied and that you have exceeded their expectations. One unhappy patient is one too many. So basically what I'm trying to get at here is a company I used to work at. Uh, we, used to sell, we used to sell clothing. And I remember one time, uh, or sorry, this company basically had a policy that the customer is always right. The customer is never wrong. I remember one time uh, sitting up the front cash and one of the managers, a lady came in to return a jacket. And the man looked at the, this uh, lady and said, uh, thank you for uh, coming here today. Uh, Ma'am, this jacket, we don't sell this jacket. This is actually a private label from, I believe at the time it was a company like Saks Fifth Avenue or, or um, you know, Bloomingdale's or Macy's or something like that. We don't sell this in our, in our in our store. And the lady looked at him and said, Sir, I'm pretty sure I bought this uh, jacket here. He said, Ma'am, we don't even sell this brand here. And she said, Are you calling me a liar? And basically he turned around right towards her and said, Ma'am, how much did you pay for this jacket? And she said, I paid $50. And so he handed her a $50 store credit to go buy anything else in the store. And I looked at him afterward and I said, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. Like, uh, you just gave that lady a $50 store credit for this jacket that we don't even sell in our in our store, and we're probably not even going to end up selling. We're probably going to end up giving it to uh, one of the Salvation Army or Goodwill or something along those lines. And he basically just looked at me and said, you know, our company policy is to ensure that not a single person is unhappy. You and I would understand what this lady's, you know, what this lady's concerns were. However, everyone else in the store and everyone else this lady would encounter during that day, all they would see is that she was an unsatisfied customer. So from their perspective, from a marketing perspective, the best source of business, as I said, is happy customers. So this lady basically spent this $50 in the store and she was happy, you know, she was happy, we were happy, everybody's happy, and, and that's and that's great. The other thing is when you do good work for people, and this is an unfortunate you know, just aspect of human nature. They'll probably you'll be lucky if they go tell one or two people about you, unless of course you know you ask them to go spread good word about you. But the unfortunate thing is, if you do something for someone and you've either uh, you haven't met their expectations or they were unhappy with something or unhappy with an encounter with somebody at your office, they will probably go tell a hundred people about what a terrible person you are. So. Uh, if you can focus on investing and making sure that every patient encounter is good and you've exceeded their expectations, I cannot but stress the importance of internal referral, which segues into the next topic, which is about external referral. So uh, a lot of people will come to you and uh, basically promise you the world if you use some sort of advertising. And basically advertising is a form of, uh, as a branch of marketing, and it's a very unique uh, area in, in marketing. However, like and it, uh, I probably get like I don't know maybe like ten to twenty emails a month telling me about search engine optimization for my website and other companies that basically tell me that they'll put me in touch with the target market that I'm and I'm looking for. And I would sort of chuckle and say to them, oh, "Okay, so what is my target market?" Just to see if they have an idea of what my business is all about. And more often than not, they don't. Uh, and the unfortunate thing is, you can probably end up spending thousands upon thousands of dollars. Uh, in different marketing ventures and probably realize uh, no benefit uh, from your pa practice perspective. So the point number two I make here from an external referral perspective is ensure that if you advertise, you evaluate the effectiveness of your efforts. So I can tell you that there was one uh, the car dealership uh, that I knew of and they basically would advertise a full page ad in a newspaper and for each full page ad in separate newspapers they'd have separate phone numbers and basically they would track what phone calls came in on those phone numbers and they knew that these phone numbers were only printed in that print material so they were able to very effectively manage or evaluate the effectiveness of their of their uh, their advertising ventures and know which newspapers or print media or internet or any of those sorts of things actually worked well for them and which did not so in terms of marketing materials, there's different types of things that are available. As we spoke earlier about education, uh, we try to use a variety of different types of handouts and pamphlets uh, to educate our patients. Uh, I realize that ed handouts and pamphlets aren't actually like, you know, sort of like high quality education or high quality interaction. Obviously, a consultation with you would be the best. But you can many times use these things because they have some text and they have some pictures in them. And uh, use these things to basically sort of whet people's appetite or sort of get them to start thinking and asking some questions or perhaps booking that consultation appointment to talk about that edentulous space that they have or, uh, you know, the stained tooth or the discolored tooth 
uh, or even you know a, a restoration that they don't find aesthetic. Uh, websites are also something which are interesting. I already talked about my biases on search engine optimization. I think if every oral healthcare prote- professional optimized their website. Uh, uh, you know, everybody would be going to uh, so basically what I say is unless you own Google or you own the search engine, there's no way you're going to be you know popping up as uh, number one unless you're spending, you know, God knows how much per uh, per click uh, to get uh, business to come towards you. So websites are always, a, you know, a good tool uh, to use to basically highlight the types of things that you can do. But, you know, do keep in mind that if you're going to have a website, most people, you know, as much as, you know, you love your website, most people probably aren't going to surf through your website that much. They don't really, you know, like having a lot of text on there or a lot of things probably, you know, is not going to do you much benefit. You know, deep in, uh, you know, if someone really wants to read it, uh, uh, they they may, but uh, to basically have like you know simple simple things on your website, a simple website is probably the best uh, best way to go. Uh, in terms of print ads, there are print ads that are available through various newspapers, through you know, uh, uh, you know big mail outs and stuff like that. Do realize that for you know the what they call the like the you know the mail out that goes to people's homes and stuff. It probably has like in, just in general, and that's if you're selling like a coupon or something which people necessarily want. We're not talking about like you know something. Uh, like dentistry, which you know is probably the equivalent of trying to sell funeral homes and stuff like that. But usually they have a, between a one to three percent response rate on things like that. So uh, I had, there's one company that you know came to us and basically was advertising if you spend I don't know like seventy, eighty thousand uh, dollars printing out these uh, pamphlets to communities that go out seven or eight times a year, you'll 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 have uh, you know a great response. Well, if you just add the numbers up there, spending uh, you know sixty, seventy thousand dollars to say you know potentially uh, Twenty or thirty thousand people. A one percent response rate is between two to three hundred people, and that's for if you're assuming that uh, that's something which you know the general public would want. Something like implants is very specific. So if you could try to target you know the areas where you know the, the demographics uh, that would be seeking implants, uh, you know that may work for you more. Uh, the last thing is television ads. Television ads are very expensive. It's probably one of the most expensive forms of media. However, there is a lot you can do with television ads in terms of, you know, it's visual, it's auditory. Uh, you know, there's something, there always something is going on. Uh, but nonetheless, you need to consider if this is, you know, necessarily the avenue uh, which you want to go in. Lastly, we talk about implant seminars, uh, which is an effective way to allow for information about procedures to be conveyed uh, to a general group. So a colleague of mine, he generally likes to hold implant seminars in his office for people uh, who are interested in implants. So he'll take a ad out in a newspaper and just tell people there's an implant seminar uh, coming up. If you want some information, it's free. And usually what ends up doing is if people want to have a one-on-one consultation that day, uh, he can either do it or book it down the road. The only problem with implant seminars is they're not really personal. You're sort of talking to like a large crowd and, you know, not necessarily, you know, people necessarily want to come to a dental office and sort of admit that, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, that they're interested in. Uh, you know, for us, it's cool, and we think that it's something that people are interested in, but most people don't necessarily want to announce to the world that they're interested in teeth implants or that they're, you know, that they have dental problems uh, f- for that for that matter. Uh, I had one patient, I'm just going to add this in here, I, I had one patient who came in who basically had a prosthesis and didn't want, uh, you know, their, their significant other uh, to find out about this. And, I mean, that's fine and dandy. Everything's confidential in the office. But I was just amazed that the significant other didn't actually even know that this individual uh, wore a partial wore a partial denture. Anyway, the last thing is uh, sometimes implant seminars can be offensive, so be careful in terms of how you advertise or how you market these things, and that your um, ventures also uh, comply with the regulations uh, through your regulatory bodies uh, as well. So the next le- next lecture is lecture 19, uh, and in this lecture we're basically going to talk about the value of study clubs, and really what we really want to talk about here are mentorship programs and the uh, value that mentorship programs can play for you. We're sort of getting to the end of uh, this uh, this lecture series, and as I stated in the beginning, or we state every time in the, in the beginning or the opening of these sessions, is that the purpose of this online lecture series is to give you some didactic information that you can go back to, but the next step really is to uh, sign on for some sort of comprehensive hands-on program, actually start placing implants, and then lastly, uh, join some sort of a study club or mentorship group so you can basically uh, 
bridge not just clinical experience with the didactic knowledge, but also, uh, you know, have some sort of mentorship as well. And all, of course, you know, these lectures have been basically set up or, or segmented. The syllabus for this lecture, sorry, for this lecture series was set up so that you can basically go back and forth and come back to lectures that you found uh, were useful or you may have questions about them or you may want to see again after you've had some clinical experience. So as always, we have included the references for this entire uh, program here. I do urge you, I remember the last lecture was on uh, literature review, and we covered a couple of papers that I thought were interesting. Uh, however, I would recommend that if you, if you really want to learn a lot, uh, you know, f look up all of these references and uh, either read the articles or uh, you know, look through uh, certain chapters in some of the books. And on behalf of the entire dental treatment team at the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, I want to thank you for listening to our lecture.